Going to Alan Watt of CuttingTheMatrix.com, a long-term researcher, author, research, uh, somebody who I found is really spot on with his analysis. There are a few people out there, because I've read hundreds of history books, hundreds of globalist handbooks, hundreds and hundreds of white papers, and so many times he'll start saying something, and I've read the document years ago and even forgotten about it. He's somebody who I can tell you is just right on target and, and teaches me a lot. You know, we all teach each other, uh, but I always really, really... I don't want to say enjoy because it's horrifying having Alan on to really help folks get a higher level of understanding and take the blinders off. So we're going to talk about a host of issues today. Alan, good to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be back on, Alex. Alan, a caller called at the start of the hour and he said, I want you to ask Alan Watt the power structure. We hear about Bilderberg, Trilateral Commission, CFR, Illuminati. Uh, you know, is it the banks? Is it the military industrial complex? And, you know, I just pointed out there's less than 200 people that chair and head up uh, the Fortune 100, and they all cross chair, sometimes on hundreds of boards, all these other organizations. They all push for the same thing global governance, tyranny. But, but I thought we'd get you to talk about that structure, that, that architecture from your perspective, but also the different cultures and ideas that fed into it. Uh, and, of course, I call it the priest class because that's what they call it themselves. And, and, and what the Illuminati is, you've got the floor. I'm going to try to not interrupt, even though it's always thought-provoking. Spend five minutes or so breaking down its history, who they are, uh, their modes of control, and where they're taking us if we don't block them. Well, basically, it's a system, and that's what it is. It's a system and a philosophy, which is also a, a religion with its own belief system. Uh, it really has been around since commerce began organized commerce and organized commerce we don't even know how old it is we have uh, the tra ancient traders the 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 beaten dug up sumer for instance and found out there's another group uh, pre-existed sumer who were into trading uh, they lived very well we know that from their indoor plumbing and stuff like that thousands of years ago and they had the trade routes all the way to china right through the middle east and asia so uh, trading is the key to it, because along with trading comes something called money. And it's, it's different from barter, where, you, where two people can literally argue over the price of a sack of potatoes versus a sack of oatmeal. Um, once you get a third party coming in with money, uh, then, then you're under their directives, because they can basically decide how much that money is worth today or tomorrow, or they value it or whatever. And the ancient traders, we do know this from the Phoenicians, for instance, they, they, had, um, they had to not only trade with people, uh, but, but they had to, and they were seafarers as well, with a huge navy to trade, but they had to also get all these different cultures that they met along the way to accept this thing called money, which they never used, most of them, before. They'd never seen money, heard of it. It was an alien thought, just like the American Indians. It was an alien idea, this money. And so eventually, over time, they got people to accept money, and they did it by giving them loans to countries, generally to the kings or the head chief or whoever of a particular area or island. And from then on, basically, they started the debt system. And as we all know, we're still in the same system today. It's never failed. Eventually, the king gets rather spoiled. He wants all the goodies that he's shown from these traders as they come into port every so often. He borrows more. And eventually it comes time to pay him back. And uh, he's rather shocked to find out how much it's going to cost. So the Phoenicians did deals with them. Uh, they, we know this for a fact. The Phoenicians used to get the kings to uh, assemble men for armies, uh, pay them with the same thing called money. That's a key to armies as well. An army is no use, uh, an organized army. Uh, if you can't pay them with something, they, they tend to go home. They get bored and, and get fed up. So they, they used that, and they just lent the king money for, for paying the soldiers too, and then they go off and invade a country that would not accept the trade, that would not accept the money, and so on. And we find this all the way down through into even the Spartan Wars, where the Spartans for a hundred years fought off this uh, outside trade system with its money system. And the Phoenicians not only traded with, with money, it was mainly silver at that time, they had standardized the size of the coinage everywhere. It doesn't matter whose head was on it for different countries, as long as it weighed the same. So they were standardizing the money system, just like the IMF is today. Same idea. And so they conquered down through the ages. And then they formed, formed we find this around the Middle Ages, uh, massive leagues, they called them, 
there were leagues, the, yeah, the Hanseatic leagues and various other leagues of trading uh, countries and uh, like a big corporation, you might say. And they were based at that time uh, in Venice and in Holland. Uh, Holland came out of nowhere because the money men came in. That's how empires arise. They don't arise because someone's a great conqueror. They actually ar arise because those with the money move into that country with the money and the know-how, and uh, they rise it up. They move down through time uh, and skip to different countries when it suits them. We know, for instance, that from even from Holland, they hopped over to London and basically created London uh, in, in the, the, the form that we know it today. So <clears throat> it's a moneyed system. Uh, it's a, a trading system. And money is the key to, to controlling everything. Uh, that's what Rothschild said when he took over the Bank of England. And I don't believe either, by the way, that uh, it wasn't a setup to take over the bank. It was prearranged with the nobility already in Britain to allow it to happen. Because if Rothschild had bankrupted every nobility, he wouldn't have lasted very long on the streets of London. Well, that's on record. He made deals with the nobility uh, even before he staged the 1815 uh, panic. Uh, mm -hmm. And you also, you also find out too, Alex, that, that uh, I mean, you see, they brought in King George and his family over from Prussia. Now, Prussia uh, is part of the pre-existing Germany, the Germanic regions. I was one of the first countries to give up uh, in Germany. They actually put up their, when they run out of royalty, they would put it up for, for a vote for, for those with the biggest, like an auction sale. And that present, the, the, even the today's present uh, group who took over as the Georges, uh, were, belonged to the saxe coburg gotha houses. They were, these were three areas of the Germanic and Prussian regions which they owned. They were princedoms. They bought them over and they became the royalty. Their actual background was in trading themselves, so they, they belonged to the same group as the Rothschilds. And they also uh, were the last country really to end slavery. We always hear about blacks being slaves here, but uh, in, in, in those different uh, uh, Germanic regions, uh, Austria and, and, and what is Germany today, uh, you had the military uh, slaves or the Hessians. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what they did too. They drafted their men up and sold them off. And during the American uh, War of Revolution, um, they, they brought in a lot of Hessian troops because George was a Hessian himself. He said that was his area in Germany. He still owned that part of it. But you'll find, for instance, the Rothschilds and the different uh, female lineages, especially of the Rothschilds, um, are all intermarried with the royalty of, of the whole of Europe. And, and so they're, they're really one and all the same people. So, as I say, that's a big part of it. So you have money, you have trading, you have intermarriage of very powerful families. And the, there's nothing better than to give your daughter, for instance, to a king, because now you're allied with that king and you take the royal titles, your offspring become the heirs down the road, and you can control things. That's a very old, old technique. And all of, of those major dynasties... Uh, were, were and are intermarried, and now we see Goldman Sachs heads marrying mm -hmm. in, and the daughters of presidents marrying in, and all of those psychopathic and abusive, uh, sadomasochistic genetic traits are then passed on and concentrated. Mm -hmm. I, I even find uh, uh, it's, it's the astonishing things in history that really get to you when you find uh, an, an easy example, for instance, is 9-11, where down the road in New York, the day that it happened, uh, George Bush's father uh, was having a meeting with, with the Laden family, the Ben Laden family, because they have a corporation, uh, the Bushes and the Laden families, to build bomb-proof structures across the world. Yeah, that's AP, uh, that's AP and London Guardian, Bush senior meeting with head of Ben Laden family on morning of 9-11 uh, mm -hmm. at the uh, Carlisle Group meeting. That's right. And not only that, too, uh, when the first 9-11 bombing took place, people forget about it. They had to basically retrofit the whole, the whole buildings to make sure they were sound. Well, it was their company that got the job to retrofit it, and it took them over a year and a half. I think that's when they laid the explosives, personally. That's what they did. I think I really do believe that. But anyway, uh, there's a coincidence right there. So we go to war because uh, with, with, with the Bush basically facing Ben Laden in the comic strips, that is, and meanwhile, the same families have a business enterprise. That's almost impossible. And they love sick jokes to say Bin Laden yes. did it when actually that company was in there 
in the buildings years before after the 93 bombing. And in a sick yeah. way, yeah, they did bomb it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is. It's a cartoon uh, show we're given where the Bushes and the Ladens, out of millions of billions of people on the planet, just happen to be in a business enterprise. And the same, the same countries end up at war and all that kind of stuff. And then Marvin Bush was running security on the World Trade Center complex until the morning of September 11th. He'd signed over authority and they'd gotten a new management firm. Yes. And then you go into FDR, for instance. FDR, um, whose wife was a rabid communist, she loved uh, the, the, the Soviet system. She, she, she loved um, the techniques of mind control that Pavlov was doing. She went over to see Pavlov, and she thought the same um, system should be brought to America because although the children were not very happy um, and laughing and joking on the way to school, they were so orderly, and she was so impressed by this orderly, how they were orderly and collective. So, but the thing is, too, in one of her books, she put down uh, the genealogy of FDR and herself because she was a cousin of FDR, the Intermari, to keep power and wealth amongst themselves. And you find that um, the Sachs family, who initially funded Hitler to power, uh, was a relative uh, of, of FDR. Uh, and again, it's the same kind of Sachs family of Goldman Sachs, basically. You, you can change the name and, and a spelling a little bit here and there, which is a favorite trick of theirs down through the ages. But it's the same bunch, really, running the show. And he brought in a new deal. Now, people don't realize when a president uh, gives you a, 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 an address to the nation and calls something a new deal, he's... He's giving you something that supersedes or replaces the Constitution. Yeah, this is the new America. I mean, it's yeah. like with Obama saying change. This is a new deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what change is. You're, you're right on with that. Because this is the century of change. Now, these characters all know what they mean by the century of change. It's the culmination of their, of their centuries-long uh, war to take over a world, standardize the world, um, basically reduce the population to a manageable level. They've had science is at the top of the tree when it comes to their belief system. They believe that with science and sciences, um, then they can control Because the if you can world. eradicate countries and then even individuals, there's no way to resist because you've got a drugged out, mindless zombie drooling telling you about UFC fights. Absolutely. And from the earliest times, even when Rosicrucianism, which is a front group, basically, to help the, the dominant group, uh, when Rosicrucian uh, broke out really in France, they had posters out there uh, all over Paris one morning, and they talked about the ability to give longevity to those who would help serve them. And they were really into real chemistry, not alchemy. Alchemy was a front for them. Uh, but they were into real chemistry and real, what we call real medicine. Yeah, they admitted that two days ago, that, oh, the Chinese 4,000 years ago were in trade with America and with Africa. Oh, and the nobility of Europe always knew this. They had all the maps. They were just keeping the public in the dark during that period of reengineering. Absolutely, absolutely. And they can take whole chunks of history away. They've done it before because we know darn well uh, that uh, there were people here in, the, in America as long before Columbus and uh, the, the bash professors who come up with the evidence, too. Well, no, they've tested itself. the DNA of Native Americans, and uh, it's, it's, it's Northern European uh, in the last 15,000 years in the mitochondrial DNA because they were all here intermarried. They've dug them up all over the country. The media keeps it quite quiet. They dig Vikings up every year. We'll be right back with Alan Watt, the true history of the world and what's currently happening straight ahead. I'm Alex Yo. Alan, going back, though, not just looking at trade and money and, and governments that uh, could create caste systems and organization, were very small members of, you know, Europe in the last 4,000 years went to northern India and took over. They've tested their mitochondrial DNA. Uh, they're uh, Central and Western European. Not just that, but also the priest class of manipulation and learning how to control the population. That's a big key to this secret knowledge that's passed on as well. Yes, uh, the, the studying of, uh, as I have, I've always said, we see so many nature programs on television, uh, but we don't realize that mankind has been the most studied creature on the planet for thousands of thousands of years. If you want to dominate the planet, you don't have to dominate the ants, you want to dominate people, and uh, you have to know how people think, how they tick, and it's, and it's quite easy, actually, because the easiest thing is to go into so-called primitive societies and see the microcosm of what really matters.